Okay. Back in um, biceps. Uh, Look at the wind blowing. I don't know if you can see it on the video. It's so crazy. See the sky? I really hope you fun. Yay! Good job, buddy. Do it again. So great. Yeah, don't, don't mock me. What's up, buddy? I just want to show you guys where I'm eating my little. Burr. Trying to get the background there. There it is. I'm too short. Last night, except my dog, so he's just staring at me like I'm crazy. Lay down, buddy. You're fine. I'm Chaplain Dot Richards at Yahoo.com. I'm Chaplain Richards. My email address is Chaplain Dot Richards at Yahoo.com. If you have any questions, if you need the packet uh, to fill out the worksheet for this, you can email me. I'd be glad to send it to you. It's not a problem. Um, it should be on the church website very soon and a Facebook account as well but uh, let's continue this is part three I believe maybe three and four depends on how long uh, we go for I'm usually getting about two done a session because I tend to talk a lot <laughs> sorry about that uh, it's the teacher and me but we did steps let's see we did steps so uh, let's look back <clears throat> A little review, what is, the, what is Bibliology? Bibliology, it's the study of the Bible. It discovers and explores the origin of the Bible, how it came to be, and stuff like that. So, and there's usually 10 steps. Scholars have determined there's usually 10 steps involved in Bibliology, which basically help us to understand why we have the Bible we have today. Um, the 10 steps are revelation, inscripture, inscripturation, inspiration, canonicity, Interpretation, preservation, translation, authority, animation, and illumination. And we are on step. We did so far, we've done um, revelation. We talked about the two different types of revelation. We've done the scripturation, which is basically the written account. And sometimes that is actually where God says, Write this down. Other times it's where God moves man to write. It's protected by God. Inspiration is the influence of the Holy Spirit as men write. Uh, inspiration or, uh, inspired literally means uh, God breathed, as if God exhaled. Literally means ex to exhale. So that God exhaled the words and the prophet or the writer inhaled the words and wrote them down. Canonicity is, um, remember the word canon was a read for measuring. So canonicity, we get that word from determining which scriptures belong in the Bible. And if God knows it, it was just for us to recognize. And these are the things that we do to recognize that it's authentic, that it came from God. Step five, let's see if this marker works. Step five. Interpretation. Okay. Interpretation explores the intended meaning of God's message. The point of interpretation is for mankind to understand the Word of God. After mankind understands it, he or she must apply it to his or her life. 
Interpretation deals with the careful and accurate handling of God's word. Uh, how do we do that? How do we handle God's word correctly? How do we understand something that was written thousands of years ago and in another language by a different culture, by a different period of history? We live in a way different time than they did when they wrote the scriptures. So how do we interpret it? Well, the process is called hermeneutics. Hermeneutics deals with the careful and accurate handling of God's word. Okay, hermeneutics. Spelled it wrong. Yeah, I did, didn't I? Never fails. Eat. Sorry about that. That's why I have an editor for my books. <laughs> All right. Hermeneutics is the science and art of interpreting the Bible. Now, why do I call it the science and the art of interpreting the Bible? Um, because the science part of it is there really is a methodology that's been successful and used, used throughout the years. And um, it's something that anybody can do and anybody can use. Uh, for example, like the Strong's Concordance numbers, that'd be the science of it. You can look those up yourself. The art of it is the part of being almost like a detective. And that's where you would look at the history and the culture of the time period and maybe study the more about, say you're looking into the letter of the Corinthians, to the Corinthians, look into the life of Paul. What was Paul doing at that time? Where was he? Was he in prison? Was he uh, out preaching on the road? Like what, what was going on in his life? That kind of gives you some insight into what he was writing and why he was writing also what was going on in the church of corinth at that time there was maybe temple prostitution going on there was other things that were going on that caused paul to write what he wrote um things that influenced his writing that would help us to understand the interpretation better to better to better interpret it better <laughs> better interpret it better make a better interpretation okay it is, it is made up of rules and methods for searching out the intended meaning of Scripture. Now that's, that's a big thing there. You'll see that a lot when people talk about interpretation. They, they use the word intended. What was the writer's original intent when he wrote what he wrote? Okay. Um example could be Philemon had to do with slaves and how slaves interacted with their owners now did the writer of Philemon was he condoning slavery and saying that slavery is a great thing and all of us should have slaves I don't think so I think he his intended meaning was in that present situation where there were slaves this is how a good slave should act and this is how a good master should treat his slave does that make sense um, You've got to look beyond just what's written there on, on the words because we're, we're translating it from a long time ago and we're translating it through uh, maybe one or two languages. It really should be just one. But there, if you notice, I believe it was the King James Version. Um, originally, it was translated from, okay, so it was the Koine Greek or the Aramaic was translated into the Latin. And from the Latin, it was translated into English. That's like a double, uh, you know, translation system there. Do you understand what I'm saying? You're going from the original language to another, to another language, and then to our present language or to the present language at the time. Okay? What really is helpful to do is to go back to the original language. Start with the Koine Greek, okay? And translate it from there. It's one of the reasons why they make pastors 
and chaplains and things like that when they go to seminary learn these original they're called dang up dead languages because no one speaks them anymore no one usually writes them or, or talks about them unless they're in the priesthood or the, or the pastorship or shepherdship <laughs> uh, pastoring and I so I have to apologize I've, so I get these migraines and I had an attack um, so yesterday m morning night woke me up in the middle of the night with the worst migraine ever um, I've recovered but I still now it's just at the point where it's like a what people would call a bad headache so I've drop down from the migraine to just a bad headache and it still is really, really intense. If I move my head too hard, it'll just pound like crazy. So I apologize if I seem a little out of it. I'm just in pain. All right. <clears throat> uh, let's see, hermeneutics. Normal in plain. Normal, is this is what we call it. Uh, normal hermeneutics are normal and plain hermeneutics. There, there may be different types of hermeneutics out there that are um, like some, some beliefs and some faiths and some denominations will use a symbolic hermeneutics, which means they take and they transfer everything that's written into a system of symbols. Um, so that everything it means so everything means something that ne doesn't necessarily have to mean something. They look for symbols in everything. They look for allegorical or metaphorical meaning in everything that they're reading. And it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be that way. So the, the best and the most conservative and the most trusted is plain and normal hermeneutics. Okay. It tends to be the most consistent. There's your word to fill in there. Consistent and accurate method of biblical interpretation. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, 15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Okay, that's interpretation. If there was people here, I'd say, are there any questions? Uh, I'm sure you'd have questions about interpretation because it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty hefty process. And you have to trust the people that are doing it, that they are being led by God. And, um, and that you yourself, as you interpret it, you're being led by God. And you're being led by the Holy Spirit. Now, I think that we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Uh, is one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is to guide us into all truth. And to help us with that interpretation. So you have to be in the spirit. You can't be in the flesh trying to interpret scripture. It doesn't work. If you let your flesh interpret scripture, you're going to get it wrong. If you let God's spirit help you interpret scripture, you're going to get it right. Does that make sense? All right. Uh, I need an eraser. I guess we're not going to use the purple. It's too light. Let me just look at the black one. Alright. Okay, step six. It's preservation. <laughs> Why am I writing persevere preservation? <laughs> wow. Sorry guys. My head hurts. Preservation. This step discusses how God protected his word. You know, it was written for over a period of 15, 1600 years by 40 different writers and different countries, different continents, different from us, different time period. Um, how did God protect that? So this step looks how God preserved his word, okay? 
And the word for the next one is divine. This divine protection has allowed the Bible to remain true, even after many years and many translations. Um, yeah. Can you see the board? Is that a good spot? Yeah, I can see it. Uh, I can't see the top right corner, but... All right, well, you missed a step. I missed a step? Yeah, I just did um, interpretation. Talk a little bit about hermeneutics and then the importance of normal plain hermeneutics as compared to like symbolic or symbolism and things like that that are often used by some of the uh, less conservative groups. Um, so now we're on preservation. Just started that one, step six basically discusses how God protected his word. We've got a period of, it was written over a period of 16, 1500 years by 40 different writers, different countries, different continents. Like, doesn't it just, doesn't it just blow your mind how we still have the word? Like it's still reliable. It's still God's word. That's part of this divine protection that we're talking about. This is step six, preservation. This is how God protects his word. And I was just bringing up, when you called, I was just bringing up Dead Sea Scrolls and how, was it, was it, was it 49, 1949 when they discovered or 63? I keep getting the dates. I'll have to look it up. Um, but the, you know, it was a kid who was, who was uh, doing some shepherding and supposedly he fell, the sheep or him fell through a hole, ended up in this cave. And here's the thing about the, it's so cool about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, it's by the Qumran Monastery, and they were a sect of Jewish scholars that separated themselves from society completely because all they did was handle the Word of God. It was their job to copy and translate the Old Testament, okay? That was their job. Now, they, they considered the scriptures to be so sacred and so special that they could get through, like, you know, we're talking about scrolls, right? Where So you'd roll out, like, 15 feet of parchment for the chapter 11 of, of, Isaiah, of Isaiah, right? And he's going to copy it over onto that scroll. He gets all the way to the end and he makes a mistake. Dang it. I skipped a line or I forgot a word or I misspelled something. Okay, you know what they would do? They considered these scriptures to be so holy and so blessed by God that they would burn them in a ceremony or bury them underground. So the Dead Sea Scrolls are most likely, because they were in these canop canopic jars, like these mummified jars, it's very likely that these the Dead Sea Scrolls were the rejected manuscripts that didn't make it through the editing process. Because you'll see like uh, in some of the, like it's so cool because you can take what we have today and look back at what you see in the Dead Sea Scrolls and it's 99.9995, I believe, percent accurate. I mean, it's within a small, small, tiny, tiny percent fraction of it being wrong and what you find wrong is things like what does that look like to you no no well I wrote out a word that oh. was in the Dead Sea Scrolls oh. but it's Hezekiah I know it's really hard for you to see with that, the camera, sorry about that. But basically, no, basically Hezekiah, it, it's just, it's just misspelled. So they took it, they rolled it up and buried it in the, in the canopic jars because it had that misspelled word. So we're digging these things up and we're finding that it's 99, it's so close to being accurate, but these one tiny little mistake and they said, nope, nope, nope. That's part of the preservation. That's part of God used these people, I believe, to preserve his word. 
throughout those years that they existed. Uh, you can do research the Qumran Monastery. I believe it's spelled Q U. By the by the Essene monks. Well, we call them monks, but they were well, whatever the the version of the monks were for the Jewish faith. Um, we'll just say monks. They had another word, and I forgot the word. But basically, they were people that uh, they would not go into society at all. They would have groceries delivered to them. Like they were, they were in the monastery to copy and be perfect and pure. They'd go through these symbolic rituals of purifying themselves before they touch the scriptures and all these pretty awesome things. That I just, it blows my mind that they're that zealous about it. They devoted their entire lives to copying God's scriptures. So this was about, um, what did they date the Dead Sea Scrolls to? I should look that up real quick. Oh, I can't. My phone's busy. Um, I want to say is actually between is actually what we call the the silent years. Um, so we got we'll look at the excuse me right here. We're going to study this later when we get to the scriptures, the actual scriptures, and we're going to see that there's 400 years. From the time of Malachi, where God gave the prophet Malachi the word of Malachi, from that time to what was the first book written, 75 uh, AD? The first book was written in 75 AD, I believe. Uh, I don't have that written down right now. Anyways, uh, but there was about 400 years of silence. And it was during this 400 years that the Qumran monastery existed, the Essene, the Essene um, Brotherhood. The Essene Jews would translate these scriptures and uh, copy them. Uh, we call it the silent years. Do you, you remember that in, in your classes? Yeah. Where, where God didn't, God basically, I'm, I'm, I'm done with my revelation. I'm done speaking. You got the Old Testament here. You got the New Testament here. Um, and you, what is this? Uh, this would be AD, 0 AD. Okay. Uh, from 0 AD, then you have, of course, Christ and the, the New Testament. But before that, you got 400 years, 400 years right here, called the Silent Years. That's when you got the Kermal Monastery, the Seen Brothers, uh, doing those translations, doing those uh, copying. Pretty cool, pretty cool. Uh, let's see, we can blast through this real quick. Let's see, the function of this step is determine the divine authorship of the written records. Okay. We already discussed this. There's more than 40 writers involved in the Bible, compiled over a period of 1,500 years. Some scholars even say 1,600 years. Three different languages of the Bible include Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Aramaic is spelled Aramaic um, and Greek, which is actually the Koine Greek, not just Greek. It's very specific Koine Greek. Now I'm gonna go on a rabbit trail here for something that's so cool. I think is, I think it's part of preservation. I think of God, God's, God's just protecting His word again. Who conquered the known world? Let's, let's have a little history lesson here. We got any history buffs in here? People that conquered the known world. What, what do we got? We got the Assyrians, Babylonians, Persians. Before the Romans, you had who? Alexander the Great. And the Greeks. Okay, check this out. Alexander the Great was knew that it was, in order to control the conquer world, you had to have trade routes going throughout all the known world. You had to, because you had to get supplies to people, you had to get taxes from people, tribute. I mean, all that was so important. If there was a rebellion, you had to get people, 
soldiers on the road to go put down the rebellion, or you, you got invaders, you had to get soldiers on the road to go put down the invaders. So that was part of his, his legacy, was establishing this trade routes throughout the entire known world, Africa, Egypt, um, Asia, all, all through there, Middle East, okay? Guess what language he established as the trade language for those routes? Yep, Koine Greek. Doesn't that blow your mind? Okay, God wants his word to be carried throughout the entire world. Starting with his first church, which, you know, after, after they were persecuted, they spread out everywhere, right? The whole world. They traveled on those trade routes. And guess what language everybody spoke? Or wrote, at least, the Koine Greek. So Paul wrote... A letter to the Corinthians, he write it in Koine Greek because other people along the trade routes could read as well and be encouraged. Isn't that awesome? Doesn't that make sense? Blows my mind how God prepared all that, you know? That's part of preservation. That's part of understanding how God sadly sings in motion to protect his word, to, to deliver his word, to spread his word, Okay? Today, the Bible exists in more than 2,000 languages and counting. I mean, it's, it's more than 2,000 languages now. I think it's like maybe 2,300 or something like that by now. This was a few years ago I did this, this research. 1 Peter 1.25 But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. And then John 10.35b, the second part, tells us that Scripture cannot be broken. Okay, my friends and family, as we enjoy this beautiful sunset from Colorado, just want to say thank you for joining class, and um, I'm going to cut it off here because the next session is just as long, so I'm trying to do these in 30 minute increments because the uploading takes forever if you go past 30 minutes. So, hope you're getting a lot out of these studies, hope you're enjoying them as much as I am. And uh, join me for the last part, where we will cover the last four steps of bibliology. And then, right after that, we're going to get right into God's Word. Old Testament, New Testament, division, and the books, and all that fun stuff. I love you all. Be good to each other. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. In case you're wondering who's doing the snoring and who I'm talking to, it's this little guy right here, my best buddy. He's on my lap all the time. I see your face, bud. That's my buddy. That's my buddy.